There we go. Hey, you're ready. How are we doing? It is Thursday. Gonna play some more Citizen Sleeper. Which is, and I'll play this for a little bit. So we're gonna play some now. And hopefully we'll probably, probably finish this fairly quickly. Well, not fairly quickly, but today. Uh, so what are we doing? We're, um, what are our drives? Uh, disabling the tracker. So we need to wait for Fen. Uh, we need to plant that seed. Do something with Yannick. Probably not do the flotilla thing, but help these experiments. So it's probably the experiments that we want to be doing so I do have some scrap so we're gonna end the cycle Uh, so, Hypha Labs, the Avery. Wait, hang on. What are we... What have we got for here? Oh, you want the club heads? Which we randomly have a bunch of. And let's just um, get some foraging for some spores. Ugh. Well, we'll get some energy back. No, not very much. Uh, let's head over here. What have you got? Caster's table, nothing, nothing. Emphasis stall, we can eat at least. How many points have we got? We have two points. one of those plant all these spores and then see what Rico's got to say over here so Rico is at her bench, running small vials of some liquid through an old chemical analysis machine. The whirring of the spinning drum fills the lab with white noise. You aren't sure if she notices you approach. Sleeper, it's good to see you. She looks up smiling. This little project of ours has been keeping me awake the past few cycles, but right now, well, I think I have something. Uh, what is it? The drum finishes spinning. 
and Rico lifts a vial from it, holding it up to the light. This is something I extracted from those club heads that you've been bringing me. According to my analysis, it's a substance totally unique on the Greenway. Any idea what it might be? Stabilizer? You want the first sleeper to come through here? Perhaps I should have mentioned that earlier. Rico's tone suddenly drops, changing the atmosphere in the lab immediately. I just thought... I think she pauses, thinking very carefully of how to continue. I just wanted you to trust us. What do you mean? We came through a fair few cycles ago. We found them wandering in the broken section near the gap. Members who brought them in had never seen one of you before. They were terrified of this strange person wandering in from the open vacuum. They were quieter than you and damaged. We did our best to patch them up and only really... And welcome to, them, to the commune. I only really spoke to them once while I was working on their wounds along with a couple of systems engineers. I'd never seen a body built like that before. I took some readings, some samples. Y you have to understand, I was curious. I didn't know what I was looking at. I just took a little of the damaged material. That's in the thumbnail. She shifts her weight to a crutch. The next cycle, they were gone. They took a little food and hiked up towards the wild margins where the greenway meets the wastes. Someone saw them in the distance, but that was it. They disappeared into the overgrowth. She sits down heavily, with a vial in her hand. When I saw you, I wanted things to be different. I wanted to keep you here, rather than let you disappear into wherever they ended up. But I also wanted to understand this place better. I also wanted to help you. It seems that somehow both my wishes have come true at once. She holds out her hand with the vial. This is for you. You take the stabilizer, the glass cold and smooth in your palm. H how? Those clubhead caps made it for you. Or at least two or whatever made those clubheads. It was right there, contained in their tissue. I only had to extract it. I imagine you understand how incredible that is. I learned enough from that sleeper to know that your body, your frame is it, runs on some exotic technology. Exotic technology that has a time limit built in. Somehow the Greenway knows that too. It understands your physiology much better than I ever could. It knows how to treat you. And just like that, the miraculous antidote that sprung from the mold, so too has this sprung from your presence here. The Greenway is speaking to you. It is welcoming you. I know it sounds crazy, but I know it to be true. And here's the evidence. And what I also know is it no longer is, is no longer speaking to me. Even after decades here, I've never seen this kind of response. Not since the antidote so many cycles ago. So I'm going to make you a deal. You bring me as many club heads as you like. I'll extract the stabilizer and give it to you freely. But you have to tell me what the Greenway says. You have to speak with it. To dig into it. To find what is at being at the center of it. I've traveled as far as I can can. I need you to do the rest. Can you do that? Sure. Thank you. I'm sorry for the other sleep. Truly I am. I'm sorry I couldn't have done more, but I'm so glad I met you. You're welcome here any time. She looks smaller now, more fragile. You realize how old she must be to have seen the collapse firsthand. You idle a little in the lab in case she asks for anything else, but she remains silent. So you drift back into the tunnel, thoughts of that other sleeper and where they ended up weighing in your mind. So, oh. Plant the seed. And then we wait. So you need two club heads. And you give me stabilizer. See what's decent. So it looks like there's nothing, nothing more here. So let's head up to the Sidreal Dock.
quite the achievement, isn't she? Sandra Sellis must be proud. You recognise the resonating voice of Castor immediately. Turn to see him, hooded and tucked into the shadows near the viewing platform. Castor? I see you remember our game. Good. He looks around, but the platform is clear. I'm afraid you'll have to wait for a rematch. Microgravity makes Tavla a little difficult. Castor walks to stand out, stand beside you on the platform. The telltale clunk of magnetic boots accompanies his slow crossing. He notices you looking at them. I don't much like it up here. I hear there was some trouble at the Havenage shipyard when they announced the results of the crew lottery. They screwed us. I know, he sighs, meeting your eye. An ugly business. So this are too used to the way things work in the core. Exploitation is the only logic they know. He gestures out at the Sidreal. You know why they built this monstrosity on the eye? Control. Certainly. But there's no corporate oversight out here, but that's not all. So this built it here because they didn't want anyone to know it exists. Secrecy is something I cannot abide. He turns to face you. There are people being loaded onto that ship as we speak. Sleeping people. Locked in cryosleep, like the person that you were emulated from. There are hundreds of them. Celis wants to send them out to a planet at the edge of the settled systems, without anyone knowing where it is. But you, sleeper, you can do something about that. You're like me, you deal with data. You can read it right out of the air. For someone like you on that ship, secrecy isn't a problem. You can ping back whatever I need, whenever I need it, as long as you are on board. With you on the Sidreal and with some minor modifications, you can be my eyes and ears. I'll keep track of Celis's grand project through you. In short, I can get you aboard, sleeper, but I'm going to need you to help me. What if I disagree? Then I doubt you'll find a way onto that ship. It's, it's not just me. Yes, your friend Lem, that can be arranged. It is difficult, but not impossible. The condition is, of course, that you go too. Castor clunks close to the window, watching the tugging wheeling around the Sidro. It's a simple offer, and the only one that get you on that ship. Please consider it. But to make it happen, I need your assistance. There's a Sellers Foundation ship docked in the now empty shipyard. I need the data from its servers. Okay. Castor looks over his glasses at you. Sellers aren't stupid, though. Their ship is totally isolated from the station. You'll need to get on board if you want to access the Airworld servers. Once you have the data, meet me at your friend's unit and give him good news. I noticed his importance to you. And the little one. So cute. You don't extract the data before the Sidril Horizon leaves the hub, then I'll get the message. We have other options, but you're certainly my preferred one. Be sure when you act, Sleeper. Once you take the data from Celis, you'll set up a series of events that will likely be hard for you to untangle yourself from. Either way, I recommend you stop asking around up here. You're bringing a lot of attention to yourself. There are only a handful of cycles until departure, Sleeper. Make your decision. And with that, Caster marches off the platform. The sound of his mag boots fading away, leaving you to contemplate the sidereal horizon and the part it may play in your future. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, let's just check. Can we buy any scrap? No, oh, you're like four days out. Okay, well. We don't have any scrap. We're just going to run, run low for a bit. Uh, Feng showed up again.
So this is the Celis ship. So that that's a critical action. So then we do this like Let's go and see what Feng's gotta say for himself. Feng grins at you as the bay door slides open. Above, in the rest of the building, people are busy, frightened. They speak in hushed tones and organize endless meeting after endless meeting. Haven Edge have avoided a full-blown crisis for now, but change is coming. Feng is in good spirits and bundles you inside before you even have a chance to greet him. That was the slickest operation this station has ever seen. He hugs you firmly. You made my job easy. He shakes you by the shoulders. I'm so proud. And... I got to watch it, watch through the cameras as the Havenage security that weren't in on the, on it, salted the station. One of them straight up just whacked Harding with their pistol. It was beautiful. They have him. He's being held, yeah. I think the idea is to use him as leverage with Conway, get them to back off, and maybe they'll exile him here uh, when they're done, or hand him over to some core authority. Now I know he won't be an issue, and I'm going to focus in on systems for a bit, seeing as that's my actual job. He points to the ceiling. The people upstairs weren't so happy, though. They've been fielding questions about the state of the eye right and left since the recording got out. People are scared. True. Not if we don't want it to be. He touches a stack of hardware. The eye is old and it was never meant to run like this. The master control points that Erlen and Havenage installed, they keep it spinning from the rim. That isn't ideal. But if you're asking me if the eye will stop spinning next cycle, no. And me and a ton of other skilled people were working to stop it happening in the cycle after that. Harden's problem was that he didn't believe in people. He believed in systems and their ability to shape the world around them. Feng squeezes your shoulder. But as far as I'm concerned, people should be the ones running the systems, not the other way around. Anyway, I know you didn't come down here for a lecture. I haven't forgotten. I managed to finish that code solution I showed you. It's a modified ripper worm. One made to deactivate that tracker of yours. But in the time since I got back, I added something extra. That tracker of yours doesn't just show S and Arc where you are, it transmits data about the state of your body, your current condition. My woman won't just deactivate it. It led it that data to tell S and Arc your body is irreparably damaged. DNR, do not retrieve. Pretty smart, right? Just slide in already. You take the drive and hold it in your hand. Then you close your eyes and open up your access ports and take down your defences. The worm immediately enters your closed network, whips through it, taking things with it as it goes. The moment they are gone, you forget they were ever there. They just blink out of existence. A second later, it's done. You open your eyes. How do you feel, asked Fang, a little nervously. Free. <laughs> well, you are free, sleeper. He claps you on the shoulder. Feng lets the word free hang in the air a little before he continues. Seems like it might be finally time for a celebration. Jenna still owes us those drinks. He laughs and you join him. And later, when you leave, you feel deeply thankful for having such a friend. As you walk away from the building, you look up the wide curve of the eye, up at the hub and the other rim beyond it. The whole thing twinkles with lights. It seems impossible to see it as any other thing, anything other than breathtakingly beautiful. It feels in that moment like something eternal. That doesn't mean it can or even should last forever, or that it will never change, fade or decay. It simply means that in this moment, this place has a future, and one that you know deeply and truly is worth protecting. Uh, so let's get... Let's get that upgraded. So what's over over the greenway? So 
So you still got time for that to uh, go. So let's uh, let's do that thing. Let's. Um, Do the infiltration. When you arrive at Lemon Mina's unit, Castor is already waiting outside, leaning beside the door. Forgive me, sleeper, but Celis is already buzzing with news of the breach. I was expecting you. This work? Don't worry, the breach cannot be traced to the specific IDs I'm about to create. Castor reaches into a pocket and produces a sleek green and white hand terminal. Data, please. You hand over a drive with the data and Castor fishes around for a converter cable to hook it up. He slots it into the terminal and after some wearing, a set of two transparent films marked with numeric sequences are produced. Two tickets to an uncertain future. The child will go with Lem, of course. These are yours, but first, your side of the deal. Something to help us make use of you. He passes you the square and you rest it in your palm. Small, white, perfect cube. Suddenly you feel a sharp pain and flinch. The cube jumps from your hand and rattles along the walkway. You look at Castor apologetically. Castor smiles. Not to worry. It's done its job. Now it's for you to do yours. You look down and see the tiny pinprick in the centre of your palm. Nothing sinister. This way we can keep track of you and the sidereal horizon. Whatever you need to do. Excellent. Castor hands you the transparent films and you see shimmering portraits of you and Lem flickering beneath the surface. Go give them the good news. He reaches across and buzzes the unit. Lem slides the door, open the door, half dressed in his gear. Uh, sleep up, what brings you here? Come in. He beckons you inside. You look to the side, expecting to see Castor, but all is empty. The unit is cleaner, better organised than last time. Lem sits at the bar, thin bar and gestures for you to sit. Mina's with some of the local kids. Someone start, start doing lessons down the way. She seems to like it. He said at the bar. What's up, sleeper? I have some news. Out with it, then. I have some cell sightings. You have how? Does that mean... Yep. We, we have to pack. Holy shit, we have to pack. He turns back to you. How the hell did you swing this sleeper? I made a deal. What a deal. Call me impressed. You show him the ID films and he whistles at the portraits. Impressive stuff. You should stay until Mina gets home. We can tell her together. Sure. And the buzzer goes. That'll be her. Lem gets up and opens the door. Mina, a bundle of energy and life, rushes into the room. Robot! She shouts. Len picks her up. Mina, you won't believe what they brought us. You flash her the passes. She looks confused. We're going away after all, Meanie. He lifts her up above her head. On that big, beautiful ship. Mina screams and Lem laughs. He puts Mina down and she runs over to you and hugs your legs. I love you, robot. She says quietly so only you can hear. I love you too. And a while later, when you leave, you don't even think to check for Castor by the door until it's too late. You stop and turn halfway down the walkway, but there's nothing there. Even the little white cube is gone. So you keep walking, back through the low end, deep in thought, excited and scared all at once.
the next morning. Okay. All right, well, let's, let's go over the greenway. Still got a few days left. Um Yeah, I need to expose Yannick. So yeah, it's working in the ward. You almost laugh when you see it. Same small recorder stuck to a different wall this time. Written across the fluorescent tape is a familiar word, sleeper. You grab it quickly. Rabia says sorry. Sabine's voice sparks up once again. She said she didn't have time to brief you before setting you up with the old man. I'm sure you've got the play by now. Earn his trust, work the block, then we need you to get into his office. Pause. It's risky. But obviously you're the, you're the only one of us he doesn't already know. Either way, we need to locate the link to s and Arp. You hear a shout in the background of the recording. Repia says, be careful. The data suggests there's some relay processing the implant data and sending it to s and Arp, But we can't lock down its position. Either it's moving it or it's moving itself. Or it's rerouting through other relays. Can't understand it. Maybe you can find some details on it in his office. Once he trusts you, you should be able to get close enough in to get into the office. You only get one shot. The recording creaks and whines. That's the final piece of the puzzle to end this. Good luck, sleeper. I'm sorry too. Be, be safe. You pocket the recorder just in case and walk away. Looks like it's up to you. Uh, okay. So we sleep. Sure, we'll we'll sit, feed the cat. Yeah, better. Spot the countermeasure on the drawer moments before you touch it. This has to be it. You can't rush it. You look at the countermeasure on the drawer. It looks like some kind of shock trap. If you grab the drawer, you'd likely have a thousand volts running through your system right now. Wince. Once you find the anchor points, it comes away easily enough. Prize it from the drawer quickly and quietly, then listen for footsteps in the corridor outside. Nothing. All clear for now. You slide the door drawer open, looking for the other countermeasures that might be inside, expecting to see a chunk of tech, the relay. But, as you slip it open, all you see is a handful of wires and an empty implant cradle. Is this some kind of mistake? You freeze for a moment, unsure what to do next. Why keep an implant cradle so carefully guarded? You remen remember Yannick having an implant, a small plate on the side of his head, just above his ear. You assumed it was for hearing or vision. Those shimmering glasses of his come to you in your memory. The strange movements is speech. You look again at the cradle and there it is, print on the frame. Proprietary technology. Property of SNARP. Rabia said the relay moved, but they couldn't get a fix on it. What if Yannick was the relay? A thought hits you like a shock. 
Yannick, with a remote relay planted in his head, networked to every single implanted enforcer in the lowland. A shudder runs through you. Is he even in control, or has SNR wormed its way into the man? Could he even be considered separate from the corporation itself? You think of your own legal status as proprietary technology. A puppet with cut strings. Time to cut Yannick's strings, then. You reach around inside the cradle and find it. A remote connection. A tiny bead of a transmitter, likely controlling the link to SNARP. There it is. You pause for a moment, and then you squeeze it. Snap it from the frame, and it crumples, sparks, and dies. It takes a moment before the shouts come before the scream. And you're already on your way out, down the corridor, through the unit that serves as the lobby to Yannick's office. And then out in, onto the walkway where Yannick lies still. And forces gathered around him, bemused. They push through the crowd and there he is, still crumpled. You arrange him a little, lie him down properly, feeling how thin his body is under his suit. You wonder how long he's been like this. A puppet for s and With the connection cut, nothing remains but his body. Which means that Yannick the man was gone a long time before now. You place a hand on his chest. You're sorry for him, but it's done now. And you did not kill this man. You've seen enough. The connection is cut, and whatever Yannick was or had become is gone. Your anger is hardcore in your chest, and all of it is focused on S and Arp. So that's like four days away. Ah, the scrap freight is here. Sure, I'll buy a ship mine fragment off you. Alright, what's going on in Greenway? One day, quite a few days. Oh no, I can't. I need to craft the ship mind first. So let's go over to Ort. Here it is. Ascend to the hub. Anything going on here? Just some component repair. Anything in the lounge? Space of meals. Binge Express.
So we've kind of done most of the drives now. So we're just like waiting for you. So we've kind of kind of done everything here. So let's go across to the greenway and Ah, you can only really get me gear all caps. That just gets me energy. And that just gets me scrap. Eh, let's just work the stacks. And then in the cycle. Suke caps. Got some more clubs. And then over here. Oh, I got some girl caps. Uh, we can export. Nice. Should be able to cook our own food here. Sweet. So you've got days to go. Nothing to do there. So you've got three days there. Let's just head across the rim. I think it's just the rim that's got anything left to do. And you've got three days there.
in the labs, we will do that. To grab stabilizer. Might as well just collect spores. Plant them all. And nothing out there. Go and gather scrap. So here we're going to grab a stabilizer. And end the cycle. We're just really waiting for... Uh, the two things to happen. In one more day. At least we've got Rabia here. Even before you enter the office, you can hear the sound of Rabia working the heavy bag. She's hammering it, chain creaking as it shakes with each hit. She's been like this since... Sabine doesn't finish the sentence. They're sitting on a stool, looking at the terminal in the corner, searching through S and all the SNARP data you pulled all those cycles ago. How have you been? I'm well, sleeper. Happy to no longer be hunted. Yadagan has plenty to deal with, and without Yannick, I'm free. They glance nervously at Rabia. Rabia stops punching, and in the silence you can hear her breathing hard. Sabine looks over at her, and you sense something between them. You realise you haven't seen them together since they tried to kill each other in the same unit. A lot has changed since then. They hooked him up like a puppet. Rigged that thing in his head so they could control him. Pushed the old Yannick out. I don't know why he let them in. But it's a lesson. Don't let them in. Another flurry. Yet again, shouldn't deal with corporations. And we never will again. She spits. She comes away from the bag. At least Yannick's death has been treated as natural. There's a chance we can come back from this. That yet again can hold on. But there are opportunists trying to take control. Sabine turns to you. Yes, but now the connection has been broken, I've been looking at removing the trackers from the implants in Yatagans and forces. It's a significant job, but I think with time I can do the surgeries. Rabia walks away from the bag towards the far side of the unit. Those surgeries will never happen if Yatagan collapses, she shouts back at Sabine. Clearly this is a well-worn argument in this unit. Will Yatagan really collapse? I don't think so. Rabia doesn't either. They look over at her. At least not when she's calm. What I understand now is that yet again can be something if we want it to be. Coming here from SNR, from the Core Worlds, all I saw was a gang. And with Yannick keeping me on a tight leash, they shudder. Rabir believes, and I want that belief. They look unsure. I also want to be done with SNR, but I doubt they're done with me. They glance away, rubbing their shoulders. Are you and Rabir? <laughs> Sabine looks fixes you with a look. Yes, sleeper, isn't that obvious? They smile. I've been wanting to say, I'm sorry I didn't tell you where I came from. I know I've apologized before, but I, I want to again. Pause, properly. When I leaked the data on the sleeper program, I was trying to help people, like you. They grit their teeth. But after all the cycles here, being pushed down, pushed around, trying to survive, all that got away from me. So when you turned up, it, it shook me up. They run a hand through their hair. But I ended up here, so... I look at Rabia. 
Oh, of course. They reach into a pocket and take out a handful of vials. These are the last of the case. You can have them. Drop them into your hands. After these last few, I don't know what we can do. With the SNARP communication broken, they look down. But I know there are other ways. Repairs of the pharmaceuticals. I even heard there are some labs out on the Greenway. Perhaps they can help. I'm sorry, I can't do more. Thank you for everything. They look away, their eyes bright with tears. Rabir crosses back to you and sits beside Sabine. They look at each other. You can't help but smile at the idea of them together. What are you two plotting? Rabir grins. Sabine laughs and the sound is a welcome one. You catch the two of them teasing each other and smile. Later when you leave, you take out that handful of vials in your pocket and look at them. You can still feel that core of anger deep down inside and you don't know if it'll ever leave. But SNARP doesn't own you anymore. They can't because this place, these people own you. They're what makes you get up every cycle. They're what keeps you breathing. You put the vials away and walk through the low end. Senses turn, tune to every sight, every smell, every sound, soaking it all in. Living. Uh, so that's that drive done. Two upgrade points. You're one day away. And this is one day away. Let's just work the bay. Okay, let's go and do... What's going on over in the Greenway, and then we'll do Lemon Mina. Rico has something in her hands when you enter the lab. It looks like a knotted twist of woody stems. A ring about the circumference of a human head, consisting of a single stalk at one side and a branched woven network at the other. As you approach, she holds it up, and in the lights of the lab, it looks like... Crown? Is is that what grew? It is. Came to the plant this morning, and this loop was all that, all that was there. The seed grew right back into itself, twisting up out of the soil. A being you encountered in the cloud, as you call it. Was it wearing one of these? She eyes you subconsciously, still unsure if she's somehow embroiled in, the, in an overlong prank. Doesn't work like that. She sighs. Perhaps wearing was the wrong word. She places the object on the bench and shuffles her analysis terminal, her, faint lit, her face lit by its amber light in the dim corner of the lab. But it's not exactly a plant, anyway, not from what I can tell. No leaves, no chloroplasts, just a series of filaments encased in cellulose walls. Filaments? See, that's why I like you, Sleeper. You're so good at spotting the unusual details. Look at this. You see a cross-section scan of the crown. It's layers of plant-like structure on full view until you reach the center. There, instead of xylem and phloem, phloem for transporting nutrients, something branched and woven glints. Are those wires? I'm not sure whether to say yes or no here. They're not wires like those in an electrical system, but they are filaments of conductive material, so... Yes, but you see those branches, they remind me of dendrites, of neurons, which is frankly ridiculous. You look back at the crown on the table as Rico fusses. 
over the scans, you suddenly realise what it reminds you of. You remember signing the forms, the walk to the sleeper tanks, the cold metal floor, then you remember the crown they fitted you with, branching structure of wires and pads. No, not a crown. They called it an interface. The tool of your emulation, your transference from neurons to electrons. An interface. That is your gift from the gardener. Turn back to Rico. It's an interface. Rico looks at you puzzled. Something clicks in her mind. Perhaps something she heard from the sleeper she had helped all those cycles ago. She starts talking, partly to you, partly to herself. If the club heads were made for you, then this too could be made for you. For your frame. She shuffles over quickly to the interface. A word that is stuck to this strange branched object quickly in your mind. You're right, that entity. It is the entity I've been looking for. She shuffles, shuffles quickly back to the crown. They are the entity which is controlling the Greenway. It has been maintaining it, supporting it. it has been guiding it for all these decades. They want to talk with you. I'll be here, sleeper, if something happens. If you wish to remove the crown, the interface, just squeeze. She grips her hand tightly. You meet her eyes, clouded with age, but bright with the thrill of new discoveries. Then she places the interface on your head and everything blinks out. Back into the river, back into the dark flow, but something is different now. You are no longer pushed, no longer blocked, no longer buffeted by the store, swarm, by the storm. Instead, it flows around you. You move and it parts, letting you past. Something else resists, but it gives easily enough. And you look back and see your body. You've left it behind. Somewhere, Rico's voice is talking to you, asking you questions. It is excited, eager, desperate to know what lies on the other side. The entity has to say to you. You realise how long she's waited for this moment. For the meeting of meeting, moment of meeting between the inhabitants of the Greenway and its protector. Yet she's still on the outside. You shake off the sadness. You will be her eyes, then you see the figure. Gardener, out in the storm, planting. It takes less than a moment to reach them. You've never felt so free. This is how the navigator must have felt, released from their prison. This, you think, is what it feels like to be in the place you were built to inhabit. Gardener does not turn at your approach. They go on planting, but their voice whispers in the waters, like a sharply rising current. You grew the gift. Good, I'm glad. Who are you? Gardener is a good name. You chose it well. I will grow into it. How does it feel to be free of your seed? They stoop to plant again. Seed? That in which you were contained, from which you will grow. There was some disagreement, continues Gardener, as if you were picking up on a long-held conversation with the others. They felt you were a danger, but they're always cautious, especially the fungi. They like old loam, known knowns, wide and stable networks. Uh, the fungi were cautious? Mostly, yes. Although there are many among their number who favour short growth cycles, thick nutrient veins and sudden shifts. He gestures out into the storm, though you cannot see them, you feel presences all around, sensing this audience with great interest. After all, they understood that it was I who made them their crowns. And without them, they would not have joined the chorus. So they see that it is only fair that you get your chance too. You made more crowns? I made them all. It was so lonely here, but before long I found them and began to let them in. Gardner stoops again. We are millions and we grow. I hope you understand. I am unused to speaking to your kind. It has been many cycles since my last conversation. I think it was Chief Executive Trellick himself. You look around and you see it. Every growing thing, every non-human being in the Greenway is here. They are networked, connected, branched and linked by this strange being, this artifact of the old station. This impossible dream of a senile farm administration AI. A living network. You could dissolve here, you realise. Free of that decaying body. You wouldn't need to be a person. Why would you? Among all these other minds. 
turn away from Gardner for a moment and look back at your body. A tiny hairline thread connects you to, it to you. You hear Rico's voice again, still asking, still checking in. Are you okay, Sleeper? What are they saying, Sleeper? Are you still there, Sleeper? Something in you sighs a long sigh. A sigh that speaks of an exhaustion beyond tiredness. An exhaustion rooted deep inside you. It stems from the effort of answering questions, of answering problems, of getting up and breathing each cycle. But something else resists a sigh. A yearning, a sense of distance, a desire to squeeze that hand that holds you for its warmth, its blood, its complexity. To make a gesture that says, I'm still here, I'm still alive, I'm with you. These two ideas spin within you, making you nauseous. If you break that thread, you'll be free. Free to dissolve here, to grow strange and beautiful, among a million others. If you follow it, if you squeeze Rico's hand, you'll wake up back in that dying body with all the pain and warmth that entails. Now is the moment to choose. Break the thread. You reach down and pinch the thread. The finality of this moment descends on you. Break it. You pluck the thread like a string. It snaps. Nothing changes. You stand at a point of stillness. No, you don't stand. You have no legs. You don't body. You are a point of stillness. A point in the flow. Your mind fizzes. A thousand new shoots break through the soil. They entwine with you, embrace you. Some part of you decays while something else feeds from that decay. The spores of your new thoughts float away in shifting clouds and settle in a new soil. Then you see Garner out there, still planting, and they stop, like an old man resting in the fields, and they turn to face you. And you join the chorus, and together you sing the song of growing things. And then credits. So this should, I think, Give me the opportunity to redo that. So yeah, we end the cycle. Because I, what I wanted, the, the ending I want. Uh, so we'll just skip through Rico's thing again. Follow the thread. Your eyes trek back to the thread across the whirling dark, back to your body. This choice, you realize, will not be presented again. Follow it. You don't look back at Gardner. You don't dare risk it. Instead, you follow the thread delicately, carefully, like a diver following their lifeline back to the surface. The river whirls around you, but it doesn't pull. It isn't jealous. Neither does it understand. It is, after all, just a river. It isn't a person, a flesh and blood person with wants and desires with the capacity for love and hate. It doesn't understand you and you understand it. So you don't focus on it. You don't think about it and what it feels like such a long journey back through the dark. You set your mind on eyes instead, on hands. Things you can focus on, hold on to. 
And then, after an age of crossing, you're there, settling back into the chair, into a body in a chair, and the overwhelming sensations that come with being a living thing, with a rich and detailed sensorium. And for a moment, you feel like you've made a terrible mistake. Who would choose this weight, this anxiety, this deep well at the centre of existence? But then you feel it. Rico's hand gripped hard around yours, trembling a little, sweating a little. Rico's hand with its brittle bones and crumpled skin. Rico's hand. And in that moment, you understand why you made this choice. And then you squeeze Rico's hand and you wake up. Oh, that's that's also an ending. Sleeper? Rico's voice comes wavering through the dark. Are you still with me? You sit up at the lab, a bright green glare that fades as you gather yourself. Here. Good. I thought you'd left me for a moment. What? Who? Tell me about it. Tell me everything. Tell Rico everything. Tell her about the gardener. Strange farm administrator AI that's grown to be so much more. About the chorus, the impossible configuration of network plants, and finally about the choice the gardener offered you. She listens attentively, but her responses are hard to read, and you wonder if she might have made a different decision had she been in your place. Thank you, Sleeper, for telling me. I know it isn't easy to say such things. People so often do not wish to hear strange truths. She looks away. And thank you for returning to me, though I know you had your own reasons. Something passes between you then, a kind of shared sadness for the impossible choice. A choice to escape your body or to stay and suffer it. Her smile is warm and gen generous, and whatever the wisdom of your choice, you're glad to feel welcome in this moment, this place. And then suddenly she stands and walks a little away, as if trying to escape an unpleasant thought. You worry that she knows all too well what it takes to make a choice like you did. So, sleeper. Do you plan to stay in the commune with us? I have other things to do. But be careful at least, we'll miss you here. I will miss you. Rico crosses back over to you and takes one of your hands in both of hers. Just make sure you think of us out here. Haifa needs new blood if it wants to survive and you're a good friend. Look after yourself. A new sleeper. Well don't let me keep you. Rico waves you away and limps back to her terminal. As she does, you notice the crown in her hand. She places it on the bench with great care. You can't help but fe feel a little curious about what she intends to do with it. And then you are out, breathing the air of the greenway, fresh as a spring morning. The dappled light makes a patchwork of the greening landscape and you walk into it, sensing the movements of the gardener's chorus all around. And you are glad to be here in this strange and beautiful place a little longer. Fine, we're hard to kill. And now the final drive Lem and Mina there is a crowd but you spot Lem and Mina immediately as you enter the dock they're waiting at the cordon where Celis security are checking the crew in to board the ship those that manage to get up to the hub are crowded near the entrance but even they know their chance of getting on board has long since gone Lem Lem spots you among the crowd Sleeper, we're here they stand beside a bag which looks to carry all the possessions they have. It's small enough to be carried in one hand. Hi, Mina. Mina is vibrating with excitement. 
She seems strangely at home in microgravity, but then you remember she spent a whole life in space. Hi, robot. You hand over the Stylus ID film to Lem, keeping your own. He turns it back and forth in the light. Where did your friend even get this picture, Sleeper? It looks like my old Conway ID. You look and a shimmering younger Lem stares out the film, harder and clean cut. I spoke to the guard there. This guard here, he nods to the white and green clad security officer. They'll be doing orientation and role assignment on board. Sounds like we're going to be working under the core crew. Kind of like an intern. What do you think, Meanie? Am I too old to be an intern? Following Lem's lead, you inspect your ID. As you lift up the film to the light, you see something strange. Something that makes you flinch. The face printed in the film is one you recognise immediately. But it is not you. At least, it's not how you look now. You squint at this ghost, confused why you hadn't noticed earlier. It is a picture you remember being taken. A memory that you didn't know you had. You remember signing the forms, the walk to the sleeper tank, the cold metal floor. You remember the s &R employee who helped you. Her smile clean and surgical. You freeze in place, thinking of the you that still sleeps somewhere in an s &R facility. They won't wake you till you are recovered, disposed of. And now you are leaving. Will they ever wake up? Sleeper? These guys want us to board. You stare at him without thinking, then notice the guard gesturing you both to come forward. You kick off and float over to them, steadying yourselves on the guardrail. You hang back, letting Lem present his ID film first. The guard slides it across a white machine, much like the one Castor printed them from. You reflexively rub the puncture mark on your hand, even though there's no trace of it now. It seems to be your destiny to be someone else's tool. Lem and Mina are waved through, the guard smiling at her excited face. Lem turns back to check you're coming. The guard beckons you closer. You shake off your doubts and hand over your ID film. The guard barely looks at it as if the, as they pass, th pass it through the scanner and wave you through. A new life built from old things. You okay? You are so slow, robot. Mina teases, grabbing at you with small hands. Just making sure? Lem nods, and you realise how much harder it must have been for him to cross that threshold. Mina struggles in his arms, trying to get to you, and Lem relents, struggling with both the bag and his daughter. Mina tumbles through the microgravity and grabs onto your clothes for purchase, pulling herself into your arms. You all proceed up the walkway, the entrance to the docking bridge yawning wide in above you. Are we a family robot? Mina asks as you move, taking you by surprise. I guess so. She smiles and presses her head against your chest, pleased by your answer. You keep moving up into the docking bridge, then along that thin glass walled connector. All the time, Mina clutching onto you. The lack of gravity means you can't feel her weight, only the grip of her small hands on your clothes. You stare wide eyed at the vast hull of the sidereal horizon, trying to think of this huge machine of home. Later, when you settle into your bunk after Mina is finished running back and forth between you and Lem with an endless infectious excitement, you find yourself looking at your ID film once more. Somehow, since the last time you looked at it, the image seems to have changed. It's still a picture of the old you, the person that signed up to have their consciousness copied and placed into the ownership of s &R. but something else crept into the image. An underlying sense of self-identification. This is also a picture of you. You now. The you that survived, the I, that made friends here, that found a way out, that escaped against all odds. The other you might never wake up, they might never live again, but so be it. They consigned you to a doomed life for their own gain. Their life is yours now, you will live it better than they ever could. You lie back on your bunk as the thrust of the Sidril's vast engines kick in. This feeling, this rumble, will be your constant companion for the next decades. It will be there when you work, when you watch Mina grow, when you dream of the planet at the end of the journey. It will stay with you when your body starts to fail. Despite the attempts of best attempts of Lem and Mina, as the years stack up and it exceeds its safe operating period by a decade. 
It will be the thing you wake up to in those rare moments of consciousness between which Mina will keep you in a frozen state in the hope of preserving you until your destination is reached. It will still be there when Mina wakes you, tears in her eyes, to tell you of Lem's inevitable death. And it will not relent, despite your desire for a moment of silence. It will be the final thing you hear as Mina shuts down all but the most vital of your functions. The hopes beyond the hope that while you make it to, that you make it to your final destination, all the while doubting that you will. But for now, in this moment of departure, it is still a new sound, a new feeling. Because of this, it is filled with the promise of the future. And so you settle back on your bunk and close your eyes, and in moments. You're sleeping a perfect, dreamless sleep. The most peaceful that you can ever remember. And there we go. So that was Citizen Sleeper. It was an interesting game. It was good, good story. Uh, there's obviously more to it, uh, but I think we're going to call call it there for Citizen Sleeper. Uh, so, thanks for watching YouTube. I'll catch you with something else.